a year or two or three out of law school uh, associate named Al Lair, who uh, um, Al's, Al's wife, uh, Marianne, is, is here tonight. And uh, to make a long story short, I can tell all these stories much longer than I'm <laughs> believe me. Um, but uh, to make a long story short, uh, um, um, you know, we, we went to court and, and uh, we won the injunction. And we, you know, they had the injunction drop. And uh, I asked a couple of people here, I guess we couldn't find it, but there was an Asbury Park Press front page headline, Aeroplane to Fly Saturday. You know, I'd love to have it. I mean, but it was uh, it was great, and then uh, uh, Al became one of my one of my best friends. When my kids were little, he and Marianne were going to get the kids when uh, somebody eventually <laughs> killed me. Uh, and yeah, and uh, uh, yes, so uh, um, we did, you know we did that show down here. So so you know I've got a lot of beginnings and a lot of history uh, down here. And we opened the Capitol in the December of uh, of seventy one. Um, about six months after the Fillmore East closed in New York City. Uh, and, and when the Fillmore was open, it was very hard to get big acts to come to New Jersey because there was an exclusivity. You couldn't play within uh, 75 miles of New York City. So, you know, I was doing shows, you know, at, at, at colleges and in and, and, and various places around, but it was always after they had played the Fillmore, like six months later. Um, anyway, the Fillmore closed because um, at the time Bill Graham, who owned it, thought that the uh, industry was getting uh, too commercialized. Um, he's rolling over his grave right now when he sees <laughs> what's, what's, what's happened now. But it gave us the opportunity to open the Capitol, and the Capitol became uh, very successful, very embraced by uh, my generation. The thing that was cool about the time with me is, you know, I was doing these shows, and it was my own generation. And so both the Capitol and when we started in, in, in Asbury, a couple of years later at the Casino Arena. I haven't seen one of those shirts in decades. Uh, and then moved to, 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 to Convention Hall. Um, it was our place. It wasn't mom and dad's arena or stadium or, 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 or theater at the time. It was, it was our place. And it, and, and it worked for everybody. It worked. We've got lots of, lots of staff here that, that, uh, that, that, worked, that, that, that worked there that have stayed friends, made lifelong friends. Um, from 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 those days, um, and then we used to, we, we we after a couple of years we closed down the Capitol in July and August and moved on down to Asbury for the summer, uh, and uh, you know again everybody including me, you know this was just a hoot, you know we were we were getting paid and, and making money to put on rock and roll shows and spending the summer on the shore, you know what what. Yeah. You know what? What more could you have possibly Something asked for? Better. Yes, exactly. Uh, so uh, I've already forgotten the question. It, uh, <laughs> it was about it, hustling golf. It, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, so. And as you can tell, John doesn't like to talk yes, much at yes. all. Yes. He's very so, shy. Uh, <laughs> for the answer. Yeah, well, the question was about the Sunshine Inn, so... Oh, yeah, uh, okay. Was... So the Sunshine Inn went away after a couple of years. Uh, I got paid by, by, by the crook that owned it. Uh, uh, I, got, I, I got to meet, you know, Steve Van Zandt and Bruce Springsteen, and, uh, you know, maybe more... Uh, is just as important as a guy named Mark Brickman, who seems somehow to have been forgotten in the, uh, in, in the history of Bruce Springsteen. Um, Mark, I can tell you, because I witnessed it, uh, Mark... Uh, created the persona that you all know as Bruce, Bruce Springsteen. When I first met Bruce, he was a shy guy. He, he uh, as a matter of fact, the first major tour I think he did after he signed with Columbia Records, he, he opened up for Chicago and with an acoustic guitar. Um, but Mark um, was a consummate, consummate showman. He has become one of the great lighting designers and, and, and uh, production uh, uh, gurus in the world. Uh, Pink Floyd, uh, The Wall, uh, McCartney, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I was there with Mark screaming, "Jump out onto the audience! Jump into the floor! You know, come on, you pussy!" You know? uh, and, 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 yeah, exactly. And and so, uh, despite all of the things that have been written about uh, the uh, the creation of, uh, of of Bruce and the E Street Band, um, I don't know that there ever would have been. The thing that you know as Bruce and the East Street now without Mark Brickman. He doesn't get the credit. So. Uh...
So, <laughs> Sunshine Inn uh, closed, and um, you know we continued our our Shore and Asbury uh, business at uh, in Asbury. What are some, see, this is one of the reasons journalists, another reason why journalists love John Cherry. You don't have to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> but uh, what are some of the other acts that played at uh, Convention Hall? Well, when I was a kid, uh, it was interesting, and, and, and I used to go to Mo's, the Moe's shows, or sneak into Moe's shows. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you saw all the great Motown acts, you know, the Supremes, the, the Four Tops, the, the Temptations, Smokey Robinson, the Miracles. The Beach Boys were there. Um, the Stones played there early in their career. Um, Mo, when I had, you know, when, I, when Mo and I got together, and he decided that, you know, he was going to give up the series and 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 and, and, and give it to us, is because in those days, this is very naive. And those of you that are in the industry, he would sort of buy whatever the agents told him to buy. This act's hot. This act's hot. You know, and he'd buy him. But as time went on, and the '70s came around. He didn't know anything about the music. He was a uh, classical music impresario. Uh, he founded the uh, Philadelphia Pops. Uh, he used to do shows in the old Symphony Hall Mosque in Newark. Um, but he didn't have a you know a modern rock and roll bone in his body. And he recognized it. Very nice, bright, bright guy. Um, so uh, you know we did a couple of show years in, at the Casino Arena, and then Mo sort of gave up competing with us. Um, but, uh, you know, some of it, uh, I don't know, you saw, I, I got the Asbury Park Press story uh, today online, and there's some great, amazing video in it. And uh, uh, one, of, one of the videos of it uh, is from, you know, if not my favorite show of all time, one of my top five, which was uh, the band at the Casino Arena. Uh, extraordinary show. The video's definitely worth you spending an hour or or so watching. It was almost identical, the identical set that they played at the last waltz uh, about, about a year later, I guess. Um, but with just the guys in the band. And you can see what an extraordinary, extraordinary musicians uh, they were. And then we had, uh, I can't remember, there's two or three nights of the Clash at Convention Hall, which was just, you know, you just stood there and your mouth hung open because you never saw anything quite like that. Um, you know, if they had stayed together, they may have been the Rolling Stones, you know. Um, so, uh, There's a great picture yeah. on the wall yeah. over there. Yeah, I, and which I've been told, see, most of the pictures here, I've been told about. So, <laughs> so I should look at Because we did, we, uh, at, the, at the time, uh, for most of my career, you know, when the show was over, if you had a poster, all right, you threw it away. Who needed an extra 25 posters piling up in your, in, 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 in your office? So there's a lot of stuff that's here and it's around that that uh, I never kept. Um, you know, and it annoys me every once in a while if I go to a flea market or something like that and they're selling my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> For thousands of dollars. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that I don't have, but... Uh, so the, the Capitol, did that kind of take off right away or did that take a while to kind of get going there? Capitol happened from the day it opened. It yeah. was... Uh, you know, we never lost money on any show until the last show of of of, uh, of the second year, um, and I was so cocky at the time that I thought anything we put on would sell out or do well. Right. Um, so we 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 uh, we I uh, pushed it a little far, and the last show in June before we were coming down to Asbury for the season, I put on Malo. What did Malo have to do with it? Malo was Carlos Santana's brother. Right. I think he's still alive. One had one hit. One hit. <laughs> right. so and I figured, hey, man, 3,000 people come to the Capitol every weekend. They're going to come. You know? yeah. They didn't. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we closed and came to Asbury, and everything did well here, too. And w w what it really was, and, and I'm, I'm really, um, you know, I'm really pretty proud. Um, you know, having grown up in Jersey and having spent, uh, you know, a lot of time down here and a lot of time in northern Jersey, um, Jersey was ignored by the world, all right? It was something that was stuck in between Philadelphia and New York. And, uh, you know, it's the, what the old 201 area code used to be, which was still down here, probably from about Princeton North, had five, six million people living there. And, and uh, 
you know, everybody didn't go into the city. Uh, so almost from the very beginning, I will say from the very beginning, first show we ever did at the Capitol was, was uh, a Humble Pie Jay Giles, sold out. You know, two shows in one night, sold, sold out. So there was this huge market of rock and roll fans in Jersey uh, that, uh, that went to our show. So we, I was really fortunate. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, uh, NEW uh, had a very close connection to the Capitol Theater. They did live broadcasts. Uh, DJs would introduce shows and so on. Um, Dan and, and Jim, do you have any? Uh, it was actually yet? a video of Vin Skelsa. I don't know what yeah. other monitors. Yeah. It's a Southside Johnny show. I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, it's on YouTube. It is one of Vinny's incredible best of all time intros. Oh, God, that was so good. He was on fire that night. John, uh, and there's nobody in this room that doesn't love John Shera, I can say that with, 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 with the fact. Um, John was uh, taking away the attention from that small island that floats off the coast of Jersey, you know, and he, he gave us respect, kind of like Bruce made, you know, it cool to become from Jersey. John did that with the concert scene. And um, growing up in New Jersey, I was aware of John through my brother, who worked with John through NEW to, to broadcast live concerts from the Capitol Theater. And there were some in, incredible concerts, but how I became aware of John was through my brother, who told me about this chef that John had at the Capitol, <laughs> which gives you a little information about my brother, because that's the first thing, not the music, it was about the chef and the food, and you have to eat it. it was a, His name was Cy Cy exactly. Right. exactly. And the guy, the guy was an amazing chef. People would rave, and, and all the artists too, right? Yeah. And when John did uh, the Grateful Dead, didn't they want to take Cy on the we, road? We, we took Cy. The whole, you know, we had a whole, uh, we had we had a whole hospitality crew, yeah. and and people followed Cy. And you know, there was you know some other great chefs. We always got them because there, there were you know people again of our generation that were going to culinary school. And, you know, hey, I can get a job working at a rock and roll theater, you know, uh, so, you know, the, you know that, that always worked, and, and so, yes. It, it all made you feel like you were a family, because yes. there was food there, and it was good quality food, and you'd go backstage, and everybody would feel welcome. And that was the thing John did, and he was so smart about forming an allegiance with a radio station like WNEW was at the time because we could play whatever we wanted and we would play the artists that were coming to the Capitol and whenever it became known that we were going to do a live broadcast all of a sudden we're banging out like constantly promos about oh, the Capitol Theater you got to see the show it's going to be good. and it just was a wonderful wonderful relationship that John and the radio station had. It was in the NEW's you know one of the most uh, you were so uh, loyal in, too. In, 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 but also I learned a lot from from the first generation of of Scott. of, 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 of Jock, Scott Muni and and you know you know one of you know one of the most influential people in my life was the GM there, a guy named Mel Parmesan. Oh. Uh, you know and and Vinny, these two guys and Vinny and Richard, uh, you know these all became friends. Dennis Elsis, uh, they all became friends and. It would be an unusual night at the Capitol that there wasn't at least a couple of NEW jocks there, you know, to introduce or just to watch or, or whatever. This may be the video that's running, and I think we're south. Yeah, first came yeah. Out at midnight, well, I'm here. yeah. And 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 uh, uh, for a bunch of years in a row, Southside played New Year's Eve, uh, and one year, I think it was '78. Uh, um, uh, the E Street Band was not on the road; they were off the road. Uh, and they all came to the show. Southside was their friend. Uh, Bruce actually introduced me to Southside uh, for the first time in this great, great tradition. Uh, and uh, two things of note happened there. Most people know the, the one thing I'm going to say, which was little by little, all the guys in the E Street Band ended up, came up. on stage and, and played. But when the show was over with, 1 o'clock, 1.30 in the morning, Bruce walked over to me and said, uh, you mind if we try to do a set? The house was already a third empty, all right, because the show was over. The house lights were on. So, yeah, sure. His brother, being a wise ass, uh, was hosting the broadcast of that night, and uh, had signed off. Yes, yes. <laughs> and that's what yes. Bruce said. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, um, I said, well, sure, you know. So we actually sent uh, 
uh, the security guys and a lot of the ushers, a lot of whom are here, out into the streets. Come on back! You know? <laughs> you know, and it was Pacific New Jersey. There wasn't a lot going on in there, you know, on New Year's Eve. You know, so, you know, come on back, you know, and, and uh, um, Richard, uh, uh, Richard decided to call the studio and say, hook, hook me back up, <laughs> hook me back up, which didn't go over really all that well with Bruce. Bruce, Bruce. people didn't like that too much. <laughs> but, because uh, I hadn't played in like six months or maybe even a year, so they were a little raggedy, but. Yeah, was, you could tell. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> the one other thing that's earlier in that, in that, I think it's that show, is Vince Gelsa, was a dear friend of all ours, um, had an alter ego called the, <laughs> called the Bayon Bear. I don't know how many of you remember the Bayon Bear. Bayon Bush. Bush. Uh, and, yes. And the, and the, yes. Yeah. And so at one point at the end of this show, when uh, the Jukes were, doing, uh, were having a party, uh, the Bayon Bear, full regalia, you know, came, came out on stage and was dancing for, you know, Someone probably went on for 10 minutes. And, and, and the video is in one of those pieces that, that came out in the last day or two. Uh, and it was hysterical. But everybody, and, and if any of you know Vin, Vin's a pretty shy guy. You know, if you, if you know him as a radio guy, he, you know, he sort of, you know, he's brilliant and, and you feel like he's part of the family. But in person, he's a reasonably shy guy and doesn't like to do a lot of things. But, um, you know, we, he, he had this extra persona, and when he got in the, in the, in the costume, he was the Bayon Bear. He wasn't Vince Kelsey anymore. Uh, and then a good, very good friend of mine, Rick Dobbs, his father, um, b b believe this or not, was a, had a, was a professional kazoo player. All right? And he had a kazoo band. So on New Year's Eve, most New Year's Eves, we, the show would start with Ruby D and his kazoo band, uh, and, and the Bayon Bear would, would come out and dance with the kazoo band, uh, and, then, and then Southside would come on. So uh, uh, they're, they're, they're great memories. Anyway, the answer to the, 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 NEW, the relationship was, was amazing. It was, uh, it, it was family. Uh, I used to do tons of interviews up there. Um, we got every act that was coming in to go to NEW, much to the chagrin of PLJ oh, and, yeah. and, 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 and DHA, <laughs> no best. offense. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, and there's some great...